I'm gonna screen questions. Okay, welcome. We're ready for this edition of Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live. Um, let us know that you're on. Um, just post in the comments where you're joining us from. We're gonna give a couple of minutes for people to hop on and get with us. Um, today is an appropriate topic. Some like it hot, <laughs> so we're definitely dealing with that. Uh, this time summer is, has arrived for sure. So we're here today. I'm going to let Mike wave, Mike. Mike Vadreen is a Brazos County Master Gardener. We are here at his lovely garden. Um, you guys are going to be amazed. He makes us all look like we can't garden. I can just say that. A great master gardener. Oh, we've got from Richmond, Texas, Cypress, Texas, Amarillo, Walker County Master Gardeners. Oh, Fort Worth, Tyler. Welcome, guys. You guys are in for a treat to see his garden for sure. Maybe before we kick it off, you can do a little walk around. Yeah, that'd be perfect. I'll just kind of pan and let you guys see. Look at these peaches. Y'all are going to all be so jealous. We talked about peaches with Tim Hartman a couple of weeks ago. Look at those babies. Unbelievable. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, from India. Awesome. Just remember that uh, we do have a panel of our county horticulturists and our state extension specialists online that are there to answer your questions you might have um, about your home vegetable garden um, and that there are some things you can actually plant now. Um, so just be listening and we'll have some resources available to you. Uh, be looking in the comments section and then a reminder that afterwards we will post all of these videos recorded um, both on the Aggie Horticulture Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. So if you don't follow us on YouTube, be sure to go ahead and do that. Okay, while we're waiting, I'm going to talk just a minute about blackberries. We've already talked about fruit in some previous uh, sessions. Today's topic is vegetables, so I'll just use this prep and wait time to talk a little bit about these blackberries. They are coming into harvest now. And at the same time that the old canes, we call flora canes, they went through last winter, are fruiting, the plant is sending up new canes we call prima canes. Primo as in first year. And these canes, if you will pinch them off or cut them off, they'll branch out and produce a lot more uh, uh, branches on the plant that can bear a lot more fruit. You can also just tie them in horizontally and accomplish the same thing. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, that's the only summer care we, we really have until the old fruit finishes up. And once it's finished producing, that cane that grew fruit will never produce again. So you can just go ahead, take advantage of some cool morning hours to get out and just remove those canes, get them out of the patch, and leave all of the sunlight and water to, to support the new growth that will fruit for you next year. Awesome. We got a lot of people joining us. Waller County Master Gardeners, Granberry, um, Austin County, Fort Bend Master Gardeners, lots of folks. Good. So Skip, I think we're good. It's about 102. So whenever you're ready to get started, we'll go. Well, uh, our topic today is some like it hot. It's vegetable gardening in the summer. And although when it gets really, really hot, a lot of our vegetables sort of wimp out. Uh, a lot of the tomatoes don't like to set in the heat. Uh, that same thing happens to your cucumbers and some of the squashes, and uh, it can be a problem. But there are things we can grow in summer, and there are things we can do to have more success in summer. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, one of the good summer crops is southern peas. Uh, southern peas are actually a bean. We, we call them peas, but uh, they would better be termed beans. But these southern peas include things like black-eyed peas, purple hull peas, crowder peas, um, zipper cream peas. They're all in the southern pea group, and they love the heat. Uh, the other thing they do that's good for the garden is they're a legume, so they produce nitrogen on their roots. And as you cut the plants off and leave the roots to decay in the soil or rototill them in, whichever you prefer, uh, that adds to the soil. Uh, so southern peas are grown until they reach a point 
where the pods are very plump and you can see the little bumps where the individual seeds are uh, and we harvest them at that stage so they can be shelled really easily. Uh, they are not a bush like most of our bush beans would be, but they actually are a vining plant. So you can see these have, have grown up the vine and are, and are twining around uh, the trellis itself. Uh, so you would like to provide something that's more sturdy. Uh, that also makes harvesting a little easier. Every time you have to squat down and get back up, uh, it's it kind of uh, not as much fun. So I like to grow them on some kind of a vine uh, like Mr. Verdreen has here that uh, really makes it easier to harvest them. Uh, since I'm standing by the tomatoes, I'll go ahead and talk about tomatoes a little bit. The larger fruited tomatoes, like, like these that you see here, they tend to not so, set well in the heat. Uh, they don't like the hot days, but they also don't like the warm nights. Uh, they would like the temperature at night to be down around 70 or below and once we get up above 70 at night and then of course that goes along with having hot days the uh, flowers don't pollinate well uh, and so as a result we see production drop on these you can hold on to them until fall to try to raise another crop but by then usually plant diseases leaf diseases uh, like early blight and late blight and others and uh, the uh, spider mites build up so much that it really is hard on the plant. What I will sometimes do is take the end of a shoot and either bury it, a portion of it, underground and it'll form roots and then cut it off from the mother plant and start over with new plants that way. It saves you from having to start transplants from seed. Or sometimes you can just cut them off, put them in a glass of water and they'll root as well. Uh, so they're not, it's not hard to talk a tomato plant uh, into forming roots. If you want tomato flavor in the summer, the best thing to do is to plant some cherry types or grape types along with your slicers. And when the slicers are getting unhappy about the heat, the cherry types tend to set a little bit better. And so you can continue to have good flavor. Well, so, so if they want to have um, tomatoes in the fall, they need to plant now in either the way you said or start a new transplant well yeah th this is the spring crop of tomatoes that ripens in, in may and june uh, primarily a little bit in july uh, and then the idea would be to replant for fall and that's typically with tomatoes uh, that would be done toward the mid middle to end of july depending on what part of the state you're in maybe even in the far northern parts you could go as far uh, you would want to get toward the July end in far south Texas, maybe early August. Uh, but other plants fall into that same category. Uh, peppers and eggplant uh, can be planted in the summer for a fall crop. They won't produce a lot when it's hot, but you'll have a much bigger plant so when the weather breaks, you get good yields on those. Uh, in July, we can also plant cucumbers for fall. Uh, maybe July, even into August, really, for cucumbers. And that would allow you, when the weather breaks, to start having a good harvest again. Summer squash could be done the same way and planted. So um, there was a question, if you could list the southern peas that you talked about. That okay. I think I had a hard time understanding all of them. All right, so. maybe some of our question wranglers. And by, by the way, we have specialists and, and hort agents from counties across the state that are helping out with answering your questions today. But that would be the uh, black-eyed peas, purple hull peas, uh, pink-eye purple hull, Crowder peas, zipper cream peas, and guys, I'm probably forgive, for, forgetting one, so bail me out here with, with some information in the chat. Okay, that right. sounds good. All Let's right. Let's go over and talk about okra. You okay. can't have summer without okra uh, here in Texas. Uh, there are a number of plants that we can put in that are extremely heat tolerant in addition to the black eyed peas or the, the purple hull type peas. And one of the best is okra. Okra is a very productive plant. Uh, it's becoming more and more popular as people come up with new ways to cook it. If you don't like okra because of the slime when you cook it, uh, there are ways to prepare it that can help minimize that. Uh, keeping the pods dry uh, and when you slice them, patting them on a towel and then uh, going into the battering process before you fry it or I like pickled okra. Uh, you can lacto-ferment okra with just the natural lactobacillus that's on the plant out in nature. You don't have to add anything. Uh, just put it in the proper uh, salt level in your water to allow the lactobacillus to ferment but not uh, bad things to ferment or be so strong salty that it kills everything. Uh, but that, you can find those recipes on the web. 
But okra is a great plant uh, to grow. It, it, again, just loves the heat. Um, th this plant right here is only six inches tall and it's already got some blooms forming. It's, it's ready to start producing. And there are a lot of great varieties of okra out there. Probably the nationally famous one is Clemson Spineless uh, that pretty much everybody planted. Uh, there are now some more dwarf types, some that are only waist to chest high, and some, actually there's some that are even knee high. I've tried those, uh, and the very dwarf ones like Little Fingers or French Quarter Red and Pink, uh, they're not that great of a quality of fruit. In other words, all the breeding has gone into making a short plant instead of top quality. But if you get up to about chest high, there's some one called Bulldog that I really like, uh, and Bulldog has beautiful red uh, um, pods, red petioles on the plant, and beautiful yellow blooms. So it could be an ornamental. If you like to do edible landscaping, you could put some bulldog plants in. And really, I think all okra is, uh, is ornamental uh, and does really well. The main thing to worry about on okra is nematodes that get on the roots. Uh, there's not much you can do about them except plant in a different location next year. There are a few things that will reduce nematode problems. Maybe that would be a whole other show to talk about dealing with nematodes. but. Uh, that, that and what would the, the damage look like if you started noticing? When you pull a plant up, the roots will have swollen areas. Uh, it, it won't be like the nitrogen nodules on a legume. Those are attached to the side of the root. But a nematode on an okra, it, it's like a snake that swallowed a rabbit. The, the root goes along and there's a bulge in the root. and the, it, Kind of the root starts to look like the Michelin man, I guess, is one way to, one way to put it. But you'll know when you pull those plants up, something is very wrong in the root system. Okra is pretty tolerant of that. I've been surprised at how bad the nematodes were on plants that were producing when I finally pulled them up. But that would be that would be a good uh, summer plant. Some other good plants for warm weather. Um, if you want to plant any time from now even all the way through August, uh, there is a, a, a vegetable type of purslane. Uh, you know we grow purslane and hanging baskets as a, as a flowering ornamental, but there is a uh, one called Gold Gelber and another, another one called Red Gruner purslane that you plant in the vegetable garden. And they spread out and produce big fat succulent leaves. They kind of have a tangy lemon flavor uh, and lots of uh, uh, some of the vitamins that people are interested in like omega uh, fatty acids and things. Uh, but they love summer and we, if you're a gardener you know purslane's a weed and if it's willing to grow like a weed that's a good summer crop. Another good willing to grow like a weed is amaranth. Um, some of you know that's pigweed and some of you are saying how on earth can you recommend planting pigweed in a vegetable garden? Well there are vegetable types of amaranth in that they make big fat succulent leaves and uh, they you're gonna pick them before they go to seed so it's not gonna cause an amaranth invasion of your garden but boy they can take the heat and that's another good summer green that you can grow. And a very high year. nutritional very level high too. Nutrition, they yeah. use it a lot in other countries too. Another one, there's a there's a plant called water spinach that uh, has has kind of had a, a mixed uh, uh, popularity I guess. On the one hand around waterways it can become invasive and so at one time it was on a list of invasive plants but a lot of cultures grow water spinach and are allowed to grow water spinach uh, for production because it's so popular. Think of it as like a sweet potato uh, with a hollow vine that just grows leaves and you're eating the leaves. Very tender, very succulent, very willing to grow fast uh, and it would be a good one. Uh, another one is called Molokia. It actually has several names depending on which culture it's from. But typically you would find it in Middle Eastern uh, dishes for example uh, with rice and lamb and things. But it is a green that grows like crazy in the heat of summer. It just does really, really well here. Skip, um, so. there's a question. Um, somebody was asking about pigeon peas and if they're the same or different as southern peas. Okay. Pigeon peas are a unique plant. Uh, pigeon peas, you plant them in the spring or you can plant them now in the summer, but they take about, I think it's 85 days, maybe more, a little bit more, to reach maturity. So it's basically a crop you're harvesting in late summer and fall, uh, but they make big plants. Think of like sunflower stalks. I mean, we're talking about a tree here. Uh, typically, I've seen them about seven or eight feet tall. I, I understand they can get bigger. They are legumes, so they build the soil, and you get your pea harvest at the end of the summer or early in the fall season, and they're very good. They're very sweet and a very tasty pea. 
So it's something different, but I wouldn't plant them among other plants because they'll take over and shade everything else out. Okay. There were a couple of people who had questions about squash. They have squash now. They were asking about squash vine borers and things like that. Any any recommendations? I know a lot of people are kind well, of getting to the end of their squash. If you know a good realtor, <laughs> um, <laughs> squash vine borers are hard, hard to get rid of. I just have a few squash plants, so I just watch them every other day, checking the bottom. You, you can, number one, you can learn what the adult looks like. It's a black and orange moth. It looks like a wasp when you see it. And once you know what the mama vine borer looks like, you go out in your garden in the morning. I've used a fly swatter. I've even grabbed them with my, my hand. Uh, but they lay single eggs along the stalks, and you can look for those, although there's always, there's always some that are going to escape you. Uh, once they bore in, kind of a wet sawdust material called frass uh, comes out of the vine. And when you see that, you just split the vine lengthwise with a knife, and you can kill the worm. It's a white caterpillar inside, a white moth larva inside. Uh, you can kill them, put a little soil over it, and, and have them continue to grow. There are some other strategies. Spraying is an option, but the problem with that is we need the bees in there in the base of the plant on all those squash blooms. And when you start using pesticides, if you don't do it very carefully, uh, you can end up killing your bees. Okay, there was a question. If you could say the name again of the plant the, that is a Middle Eastern dish that you yes. use in Middle Eastern cooking. It's, uh, it's Molokia, and I'm going to ask my question wranglers to type that in. Uh, that, is it already in? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, Molokia is, I'm probably not pronouncing it like uh, someone uh, would properly pronounce it, but uh, Molokia is, is uh, named a lot of different things in different cultures, but that's probably the one you're going to see the most. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, that's basically uh, okra, uh, purslane, uh, oh, Malabar. How could I leave out Malabar? Malabar is another green that loves the heat. If you put it in a sultry sauna, it'll be very happy. And, and we are a sultry sauna in the summer, especially the eastern part of the state. Uh, it has a mucilaginous quality. Uh, I like that word better than slimy. It sounds more educated, uh, just like okra does. Uh, and, but, you know, every texture and thing is different. And so it, it just doesn't, it doesn't bother me. But some people don't care for that. It doesn't have any strong flavor. That's true of a lot of the summer greens I've been mentioning. Uh, although purslane has a little bit of that lemony zing, uh, most of our summer greens are, are fairly mild. And so you can season them a lot of different ways. Uh, all good gardener cooks know that, that onions, you can make anything taste good, right? <laughs> so that's, that'd be my first recommendation. Uh, so anyway, those are some of the greens that uh, you can plant in the summer that do pretty well here. Uh, the, the other thing I want to talk about is summer proofing your garden and I'd like to walk over another row. Um, these are some squash plants and okra plants. Uh, one of the ways we summer proof the garden is to put down some type of a mulch. This is a commercial paper and the commercial paper you buy it in a roll and roll it out uh, and then just tear a hole in the paper to plant your plants. You need to cover the edges because it'll blow away in the sun. Uh, but this is a very good mulch to keep the sun off the soil and to keep weeds down. Um, the um, alternative to this would be to use newspaper. If you put newspaper out about four to six sheets thick all around your plants, you need to have a water hose so you can spray it as you lay it because once you wet it, it sticks down, at least long enough for you to finish the row and then put a mulch on top of it. And on top of the paper, you can put things like uh, dried grass clippings, uh, leaves from the, the fall deluge. Uh, you can also put uh, spent hay. You just want to remember when you're using grass clippings and hay that if the lawn or the pasture was treated with some of the broadleaf weed control products, certain ones are very persistent. This is especially true with some of the agricultural products with chlorpyrrolid and other uh, broadleaf weed control ingredients. And they're so persistent that the hay will still have them on strong enough to damage uh, green beans, tomatoes, and some other sensitive plants. And even the manure from the cattle will still have those uh, herbicides in a concentration strong enough to do some damage to your garden. So know your, I guess, know your rancher or your farmer uh, before you just uh, take any spent hay to use in the garden. But all of those organic materials will also decompose, as will paper. 
especially when it's covered up with something. That helps keep the plants off the dirt. Uh, we're having a lot of problems right now in some of the rainy parts of the state with choanophora rot on squash. And when the, when the rain splashes dirt up onto the blossom, it infects. And you may have noticed squash rotting from the belly button in back. Uh, that's a mulch will help reduce that, not eliminate it, but help reduce it. Uh, the uh, mulch also is conserving moisture uh, and, and moderating soil temperatures. There was a question, is it called commercial paper mulch? Is that the technical name? They, uh, what, Mike, what is the, the name of the particular paper product that it's you use? It's an OMRI uh, paper mulch, so it's organic. Okay, it's I'm, it's, I'm recertified. Yeah, it is, okay. and it's, uh, I just found it by searching for paper mulch. Okay, all right. Uh, so I guess just search for paper mulch for gardens, and this particular one has the, the OMRI certification. If you're an organic gardener and care about that, uh, that's, that's an added plus. I'm going to turn on the water right here. Uh, let me, I want to talk about irrigating next. Um, whenever you sprinkle your plants with a sprinkler, you increase disease problems. Anytime you wet the foliage, disease spores that attack that plant that have landed on the foliage are able to germinate. It's kind of like weeds in a garden. If you had dry soil and a bunch of weed seeds, no weeds would come up. But the minute you wet them, they germinate, send down their root, and start to grow. The same is true of a lot of our fungal diseases, as well as bacterial diseases that splash around in the rain. So avoiding wetting foliage is one of the ways you can cut down on some of the diseases that attack the vegetable garden. Then uh, drip irrigation is really my favorite. Uh, you can get a close-up of that. Uh, this particular emitter is called a uh, tortuous path emitter. or it's, a, it's an emitter that's embedded in the tube. Uh, you can see kind of how the tube is a little bit swollen right here. And it's got a zigzag, kind of a zipper-like arrangement where the water has to go through that before it can come out the hole. So it helps moderate the pressure going down the line and you get even distribution. Now there's nothing wrong with regular little button emitters. But the nice thing about drip is you can put it right along the side of the row. You put it, the water goes into the ground where the roots are and where they need it. It'll go, it'll soak through the paper and just fine. It doesn't have to be underneath the paper. And um, it's an efficient way to water and it avoids that wetting of the foliage. Um, Skip, a couple of questions related to um, um, winter squash and, and pumpkins and things like that. Good. Thank you for asking that. So, I mentioned that summer is a time when you clean out the fall crop or the spring crop of vegetables that don't produce in the heat and we plant for the fall like tomatoes plants and, and other transplants. It's also a time when we can plant some of those seeds for fall and some things take a while. Uh, sweet potatoes take a while. I haven't mentioned them yet. Uh, it's in some parts of the state we're kind of getting you know toward the end of well actually no this is still a good time to, pl to plant sweet potatoes. Uh, but they're going to take 90 days plus before they are ready to harvest. So you kind of have to think about fall. When it cools off, things slow down. So you can't count 90 days to the first frost. You need to back up a little from that. Uh, but sweet potatoes would be good. But another slow producer is summer or winter squash. That would be things like spaghetti squash, uh, acorn squash, butternut squash, those storage squash. We call them winter squash because they will store into the winter. I was driving through a city in Texas listening to a radio station and I won't tell you either the station or the city, but I heard the garden host say, well summer squash you grow in the summer and winter squash you grow in the winter. Well I'm pretty sure he hadn't gardened before, <laughs> but anyway, winter squash you grow in the summer, but you want them to ripen so that you can store them and have fresh vegetables uh, over the winter time. Butternut. Pardon? These are all butternut. Okay. Yeah, these, these over here are butternut. A little bit different squash leaf, but these are going to vine, go all over the place, and produce a lot of squash. And this is another one that will climb. It actually produces a tendril that can grab on and go up a trellis. If you're limited on your garden space and you don't have room for cucumbers and watermelons and cantaloupes and muskmelons and vining squashes to just sprawl everywhere, you can put up some sort of a climbing structure for them to grow on, and they do really well. But I, I like all the winter squashes. You would plant those again probably about now. Uh, the Most of them are going to be somewhere between 70 days and maybe 110 days to harvest. 
Uh, there's a wide range there. And we're, when I say uh, winter squashes, I'm talking about things like pumpkins as well, uh, that would be one of those kinds of squash that we grow for storage. So if you want a Halloween pumpkin, I would just, I would just count, look at what the seed packet says and days to harvest, count back that far, and then probably give it another two or three weeks just to be safe. Okay. About which water is being used. Which water? Um, water yeah, I can't well see all of it. Do you use regular tap water, okay. well water, or do you acidify your water is with a weak well solution? Well the the well here at uh, the Virginia Garden is the uh, well water that he uses. Um, when you're paying for tap water and it's treated, we like I like to say you you're putting drinking water out on plants. Uh, you want to use as little as possible, and so drip irrigation would be even more important uh, if you're on a city water system. Any other questions? Um, no, lots of comments about how beautiful the garden is. Well, you maybe can, we should get me out of the picture and you should just walk around the garden. You can see that he's got compost there and then tomatoes. You want to walk down here and look at the peppers? Sure. So lots of different kinds of peppers here. Boy, look at these bells. Is that productive or what? Wow. They Bells can be, all peppers do really, really well. Uh, one thing I, I'll mention, since we're talking about some like it hot, uh, when it, if, if your peppers kind of slack off a little bit in the summer, uh, keep the plants if they're healthy because they'll produce again in the fall. I've had jalapenos that did okay in the spring summer garden. And then by fall, they were much bigger, robust plants, and you can hang a lot of peppers on those fall pepper plants if you take care of them uh, through the season. Uh, this looks like uh, some more bell. Is this pimento or bell? There's uh, banana different pepper. kinds of bananas. Uh, there, there are so many ki kinds of peppers now. Uh, the one that, if you haven't grown it before, is Cornito Gallo. Uh, it's a yellow stuffing pepper that gets really long and uh, is very mild. Uh, then we have our hotter peppers, things like jalapenos, and there's a range of heat in the jalapenos. Uh, some are regular jalapeno heat, around maybe 9,000 Scoville units, and some get a little hotter, and then there's some that are really mild. One called Fool, Fool You, one called Senorita. Uh, there's an old one from A&M called Tam Mild that is fairly mild until it gets stressed and then it can, it can get a little hot. So you, you had to make sure it's not going through stress to maintain the mildest uh, flavor. Then we get up into serranos and finally habaneros. And then there are people that grow peppers that I'm pretty sure they're trying to kill you. Uh, the ghost pepper, the uh, Carolina Reaper pepper. Uh, you know, if a jalapeno is 8,000, 9,000 units, these things are what a million units or something like that I mean it's it's ridiculous um, there's a question just generally how often should you fertilize your vegetable garden that's a good question you always should start with a soil test because what's there determines what you add if you've already got super high phosphorus you don't need to add phosphorus if you have super high magnesium you don't need to add magnesium but if it's low it would be good to fix it before you start then going through the season you're basically fertilizing with nitrogen. Now, I, I use mixed fertilizers on through the season to feed gradually, but if your soil is really built up, it's the nitrogen that's the most volatile that tends to go away, uh, and you have to keep adding it in small amounts. The more you get organic matter in your soil, the rap more rapidly it's decomposing and releasing nutrients. And so there, there are different factors. Things that are gonna be uh, productive and some of our new tomato varieties, I mean, they're workhorses. They just produce like crazy. And once they start setting fruit, you can, you can really push the fertilizer to them and they'll do okay. Uh, you you want to avoid fertilizing too heavily early in a tomato's life before it starts setting fruit. You don't want to just push vine growth. You want to have vine and fruiting. Uh, if it's a legume, beans and peas, for example, they need to not be fertilized as much uh, but they still need those, th that's with nitrogen, but they still need the other nutrients. So if your potassium or magnesium is low, if your iron is low or something else they need, you need to get that right. But as far as pushing them in nitrogen, you don't want to do that because that does promote, uh, it does two things. Number one, it promotes a lot of vine growth at the expense of, of production, but it also uh, triggers the plant to um, 
depend on that nitrogen rather than the nitrogen that the nitrogen fixing bacteria are providing it. And it, so it, it sort of goes on, on to your support rather than the support by those natural bacteria that are, that are so good at providing the plant nitrogen. I saw a question on here that we have some people that maybe haven't gardened a lot before. How, how do you decide how big of a garden to do, right? I mean, is there, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, because um, yeah. you look and this could be, wow, I don't know if I could handle that. Yeah. I mean, what's a good size for a starting gardener? Mike is telling me, how much weeding can you do? <laughs> uh, that is a good point too. A big garden is not necessarily a garden that it occupies a lot of space. It's a, a garden with a lot of productive space. So the more space you have, the more ground that you're having to mow or weed eat or weed, uh, but the more you can make a small space productive, the less work it may be. And I talked about uh, trellising vine crops. Uh, rather than, you know, uh, cucumbers covering, you know, six or eight feet out, uh, the when you put them on a trellis, you got a one foot wide row of cucumbers. And so you get more out of that one foot wide patch of soil that you're having to pull weeds on and so on. Um, so that would be a factor. What do you like to eat? Everybody plants too big of a garden to start with because they get enthusiastic and they, and so they buy a package of lettuce seed and they plant Stagger your planting, mm -hmm. but things like lettuce, uh, that would be able So this looks like caprese salad. Yeah, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that is a huge grape tomato. A true grape is probably And some are so small that they're just as big as a penny. Uh, the um, those tiny tomatoes are cute and novel, but if you ever have to pick them, <laughs> it takes a while to fill a bowl with those little bitty tiny. Ones. We had somebody ask a question about watermelon. Instead, they planted their watermelon in March, and they look great. And they were told they ought to put hay or things around it to protect the melons. Any comments on? You can set the melons on something. Some people set them on a board or some hay or something like that. Uh, I haven't had a lot of problems with melons just sitting on the ground and all the melons you're buying in the grocery store, uh, no one's running through those giant fields in Texas or Arizona or California or Florida and sticking stuff underneath all those melons. So I wouldn't worry about that a lot. Um, if you just have one plant and you want to pamper them, you can do that. By the way, on your watermelons, uh, they uh, the way to tell if a watermelon is ripe, if you're growing them for the first time, you're kind of unfamiliar, is you look at the ground spot on the bottom, and when it goes from a chartreuse green to kind of a creamy white, that's one sign, uh, you look at the little tendril where the melon attaches to the vine, right adjacent to that is a curlicue tendril. And when that dries up, that's another sign that that melon is probably ripe. And with all the different sizes and types of melons, uh, you just kind of have to test it after that and kind of figure out what the variety you're growing best looks like. Um, do you promote thinning your tomato branches to allow for more airflow and sun? You can. I, the way I personally do it is I remove the suckers and a tomato sucker, everywhere there's a leaf on a tomato, a sucker shoot can grow. And uh, here's a good example right here. Uh, you can see this leaf is coming off the vine, and there's the sucker shoot. So suckering the tomato would just be snapping or picking that out. And I do the first two, and I'll do three or four main stalks to come up. Uh, if you're going to cage your tomatoes, you can have a lot of stalks. Uh, 
the ground, tie your tomato to it, and take off all suckers. And so only that one main branch grows, and you get a little bit larger fruit, a little bit earlier fruit, uh, but I don't think either of those is worth writing home about. And, and so. what about protecting your tomatoes from birds? Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there are there there are a number of options. None of them you probably well some of them are good and that's one option that you can have. Uh, our wonderful state bird with its beautiful songs is uh, public enemy number one. In my tomato bash. I'd give them a tomato or two if they would just eat the whole thing and be done with it. Uh, but they peck them all. Uh, Gardener tell me that they will take a ball or Christmas ornament and print it a tomato red and hang the mess before the first fruit starts to and break them up and peck that. It's like, well, that's no good. And then they tend to leave the tomatoes away. I've yet to find that in any kind of research publication. Uh, maybe it's out there. Throw that out for you to try if you want. I can't Any recommendations? Good. And so you are your community. boxes on the ground. Well, place in the girl. over the whole area. For tomato caging, because those look a lot bigger than what you see at the store. There's a lot of kinds of tomato cages out there. Those little wire things that have three wires or so, and you push them in the ground. Don't they'll, they'll they're worthless for tomatoes. Uh, maybe the stronger versions of those for pepper plants, but not tomatoes. Uh, I like cattle panels, or excuse me, livestock panels. Uh, that's what this is. It's galvanized wire. It's about a, a, a rectangular shape and a very strong wire that doesn't rust very easily. Uh, what Mr. Verdreen's done in this garden is use little clips, like those hog nose clips, yeah, so. to hold the panels together. These are four panels. They're each three squares wide. Uh, and so they can store guess, flat. Yeah. Is that eighteen inch? Oh, and you pull up, you pull up, store flat. If you've used the um, concrete reinforcing wire to make round tomato cages, that works. But then you got all this tomato cage material that makes a giant pile of, in the off season. So I like these panels. Another technique I've done with tomatoes is to plant the tomato row and lean a panel over the row. And as the tomatoes grow up, they'll go through the panel and they don't know where you want them to go. They're gonna flop everywhere. But you can take the vines and lay them back on the panel or kind of weave them in and out if you want. And it makes a wall of foliage that shades your fruit because sunburn is something that can happen on our tomatoes if we get them too exposed to, to the sun. Uh, and that can happen on steak tomatoes too, by the way. Uh, so I like the livestock panels. You can cut them with Cutters, they come about 4 feet, 5, 6 feet, something like that size. Uh, I take bolt cutters with me to the farm supply store. I'm going to get a panel and, and just cut them right there so I can fit them in the truck. Or the, uh, not that expensive. Maybe $16 a panel, or are they more than that? Yeah. Yeah. Bugs. Yeah, bugs. Stink bugs. Hey. All these questions uh, about things that are that are hard to talk about. You know, stink bugs are or the tomato growers heartbreaker. Uh, they
their mouth part in and then and so that like, all the tribute was like behind the garden, their opponents said no. I would recommend first learn what stink bugs look like as adults and as eggs, and learn what leaf footed bugs look like as adults and eggs. Leaf footed bugs are just as bad, if not worse, than stink bugs in our tomato patch. And once you learn what the eggs look like, I'll, I won't try to describe what you do that. hearing, but I'm not sure. Okay, well, um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Nothing has changed. I'm not sure what to, anyway. what to add to it. Well, we've gone for a while. How are we on time? Uh, probably need to wrap it up. Okay. Um, any last questions, Mike? Any that came through earlier that we didn't address? Okay. Uh, the question about roly polies damaging plants. I assume they mean sow bugs. Yeah, the little sow bugs and pill bugs, two very similar little crustacean. Um, on some plants, they'll feed on the foliage. On strawberries, they'll feed on the berries. Uh, but they're not a problem for pretty much all the garden plants I'm talking about today. Uh, I've never had a roly poly or a sow bug problem uh, on those particular things. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up. We want to thank you uh, for listening today and tuning in. Ask about one or two to ask. So, uh, someone who knows them. Questions. Really good. So, I like that. Thank you.